Have you ever awoken from an especially good dream to the routine and mundanity of everyday life and wished, if only for a moment, that you could return to that world? To stay there just a bit longer? What about forever? Little Nightmares is a series that has always resonated with me, its dreamlike world so twisted and macabre, yet somehow so compelling and inviting at the same time. But despite my best efforts to understand it, one question has lingered in the back of my mind for the past couple of years, all thanks to an interview Dave Mervick, Tarzir's senior narrative designer, had with Gaming Bible following the release of Little Nightmares 2 in 2021. When asked who built the signal tower, he responded, The world of Little Nightmares doesn't work that way. Creatures and places exist for a reason. In the first game, the maw exists because the hunger exists, and here, the signal tower exists because the need for escapism exists. This line stuck with me. Like many others, I couldn't help but wonder, how does it work then? What is the great secret of this place, the purpose behind its existence? Well now, we finally have an answer. When the Sounds of Nightmares podcast released last summer, it changed the lore of Little Nightmares forever with revelations that recontextualized everything we thought we knew. And today I want to dive into the very heart of that matter, to sink deeply into the inscrutable topic that is nowhere. Full disclosure, my intention with this video is only to provide a broad overview as to why this mysterious realm appears and functions the way that it does. I'll be skipping over a lot of the finer details here so I can address them properly in future videos. Even so, there will be spoilers for all three currently released Little Nightmares games, as well as all six chapters of The Sounds of Nightmares. I assume if you're here, then you've already listened to the podcast, but if not, please do that, seriously. It is truly excellent by every metric, and you owe it to yourself to experience the series firsthand. One final note, do be aware that I will be lightly touching on psychological topics such as childhood trauma, abuse, and mental health issues ahead, as these are central to the theories discussed. If you are especially sensitive to these topics, you may want to give this video a skip. With that out of the way, let's start at the very beginning with the name itself, Nowhere. In the first three chapters of the podcast, Noon recounts just as many dreams to Otto and, being a counselor and all, he attempts to psychoanalyze her experiences as normal dreams. But things change in chapter 4 when Noon expresses that these dreams all feel like part of the same world, saying, It's nowhere. It's a place that is and isn't. Otto is extremely interested in this admission for a number of reasons, one of which we learned previously in chapter 3. He once had a professor who postulated the existence of such a realm as this. As stated by Otto, he believed dreams came from an ever-shifting plane, a quiddity of consciousness. In this case, a semi-tangible plane outside the mind. And at the end of the episode, he concludes, If geocentrism took centuries to disprove, the question is not if, but when the same will happen to reality itself. That which we are equipped to perceive may not be the only world, let alone the predominant one. Now, we must acknowledge that this is not fact, but merely the professor's own theory. The podcast actually does this type of thing a lot, presenting information as a character's opinion or perception, which means there is still room for us to interpret things differently if we so choose. Nonetheless, it soon becomes clear that Nowhere is indeed a very real place, as Noon's body begins vanishing during the night before reappearing sometime later. This is a huge reveal for the Little Nightmares world and provides the foundation for the story told in the podcast itself. The knowledge that there is not one, but rather two worlds to consider, the waking world of the counties and the dream realm of nowhere, significantly alters the way we have to approach the lore and helps us understand how everything works. First of all, we now know the realm was created by children. Places like the Maw and Signal Tower were never built, but instead dreamt into existence, born into this big world of little nightmares. This is why certain aspects of nowhere differ from the waking world, like scale. Everything is distorted to be bigger, which makes sense as seen through the eyes of a small, scared child. Children don't seem to belong in the world at all, and Noon specifically recalls feeling half her size when standing outside the shopping mall in Chapter 3. Furthermore, the world at large is chaotic and disjointed, a fact we learn from the lady's official description, because it is composed of independent locations only loosely connected to each other. As Noon explains to Otto, it is rather like the way the Institute's basement is connected to the upper floors, but they don't directly work together. The world exists in this way because no one child is responsible for conjuring it on their own, 
It is a collective experience, the nightmares of countless children combining and blending to result in the horrors we see manifest there. But make no mistake, these are not just any bad dreams from any child in the waking world. Upon closer inspection, it becomes clear that these are nightmares specifically rooted in unfulfilled needs, particularly as they come from trauma and abuse at the hands of adults, for the diverse regions of nowhere bear a striking correlation to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. For those unfamiliar with this concept, it's essentially a psychological model that organizes human needs into five general levels, ranging from basic needs, such as food and water, to advanced needs, like feelings of accomplishment and self-esteem. And sometime later, the model was expanded to eight levels to account for more abstract needs like cognitive growth and creative expression. The general idea here is that lower needs must be met before the higher ones can be satisfied, and the pursuit to fulfill these needs is what drives human nature. In a nutshell, my theory of how nowhere works is this. When children with unmet needs and resulting trauma begin to dream, these dreams pass through the veil between realms and become a part of nowhere, where they manifest in a form that addresses the specific need in question, but in the most twisted, horrifying way imaginable. You can almost think of it as a monkey's paw type situation, though in this case the wish is latent and unexpressed. Eventually, these children will begin to visit these places while they dream, with at least some degree of correlation between the dream's defining need and their own currently unmet needs. Though based on Noon's experience, it is uncertain how strong this correlation has to be. All that being established, let's now take a look at each level of the hierarchy and identify which locations in the Little Nightmares world belong there, starting at the bottom with level 1, Physiological Needs. These are the most basic needs of all, being biological requirements for human survival, and include such things as air, food, water, shelter, clothing, warmth, reproduction, and sleep. There are four locations that fall into this category. The Maw, the Factory, the Pale City, and the Necropolis. Let's start with the Maw, which represents the need for food. The subversion here is obvious. Yes, there is food aplenty, but it is all part of a cannibalistic cycle. Each year, a throng of bulbous guests trudge up the boardwalk and enter the maw to gorge themselves with meat and wine, feeding without taste, without need, without end, after which their life force is drained by the lady, feeding her own insatiable hunger, and the bodies left behind are harvested and served up to the next group of guests. The phrase without need is key, for the second layer to this twisted irony is that the great abundance of food here is reserved only for those who do not need it, all while countless children starve to death in cold cages far below. But they are still very much part of the cycle. Any children who die or even misbehave, apparently, are sent up to the kitchens to be cooked up as well. The maw exists only to satisfy hunger, serving no other purpose. In similar fashion, the factory scene in the Little Nightmares 3 trailer might also represent hunger, as its machinery produces endless mountains of sickly sweet lollipops only to be attacked by swarms of sugar-loving insects. But this is a pretty big maybe, since we really just don't know much about this place yet. A little more certain is the Pale City, which represents the need for shelter and clothing. An entire city of empty apartments. Take your pick, they're all available. Never mind the leaky roofs or the foundations hanging over the abyss. Unowned clothes can be seen fluttering from windows far above, draped over benches, piled in the streets, all free for the taking. Never mind what happened to those who used to wear them. It's also worth noting that this is where Six obtains her own iconic article of clothing, the yellow raincoat. Finally, there's the necropolis. Like the factory, we don't know much about this place yet, but I think it might represent the need for either warmth or sleep. In stark contrast to the wet and predominantly blue environments surrounding the Maw and Signal Tower, the necropolis is dry as a bone, with a fiery orange color palette that communicates a distinct sense of heat. What's more, the city is almost perfectly quiet, as if everyone there were merely deep in slumber. Considering that sleep is a very common euphemism for death, and the word necropolis literally translates to city of the dead, it could just as well be called the city of the sleeping. And then of course there's Monster Baby, who is probably well overdue for nap time. Moving up now to level 2 of the hierarchy, we arrive at safety needs, which include things like order, stability, property, and personal well-being. There are three locations that fall into this category. The schoolhouse, the prison, and the sewers from chapters 1 and 5 of the podcast, respectively. The first two represent the need for order, though in slightly different ways. 
There is absolute order in the teacher's classroom, not a single finger out of place ever, and those who break this rule are terribly punished and often never seen again. But this order comes at the cost of absolute chaos everywhere else in the building. The halls, the bathrooms, the lunchroom, all filled with such ruckus it can easily be heard through the walls. And since this is clearly a boarding school, as shown by the rooms full of beds, we know that the bullies never leave. Everything stays the same. Much of this description applies to the prison as well, for what could possibly be more orderly and secure than a giant clock which is also a prison? For those unfamiliar, this structure is essentially a monolithic clock tower with the face and pendulum at the bottom rather than the top, and the walls are filled with countless cells inhabited by wretched, stinking prisoners with chains wrapped around their necks. Chains that all lead back to the being whom I have decided to call the Warden. There is absolute order in her prison, every day utterly predictable for those who reside there, broken up only by the eventual arrival of the Warden to torture them with wicked contraptions of her own making. They will never leave, and they will never forget their overseer, for how could they when three of her neatly pressed dresses are hung on the wall of every cell? The third location in this category is a bit different. The sewers, which represent the need for material possessions or property. These putrid tunnels are inhabited by a grotesque resident I've decided to call the Collector, along with the significant number of gnomes, and sit beneath what might be a schoolyard. Armed with his trusty metal detector, the Collector wades through the tunnels collecting everything dropped through storm drains from the world above, amassing piles of coins, trinkets, mittens, jewelry, and much more. He is fabulously wealthy purely in terms of material possessions, but ultimately they are all worthless, junk cast down the drain, and he may not even have a use for any of it. Furthermore, his stockpile will not last, for eventually the deluge will come, a raging flood of water that crashes through the sewers and consumes everything in its path. Now, I do want to acknowledge that Noon herself describes the place as representing the desire for what you can't have. The children on the surface yearning to experience the thrilling floodwaters below, and the collector wishing to possess what the children hold dear up above. This is obviously a much more abstract interpretation, one that doesn't really fit into Maslow's hierarchy, and while Noon is no doubt biased by her strained relationship with Otto, there definitely could be something more here. Ultimately, there's just a lot we don't know about this area, so its placement is subject to change. When a person's safety needs have been met, the next step of the hierarchy is level 3, love and belonging needs. These refer to the human emotional need for interpersonal relationships and the trust, acceptance, friendship, and sense of belonging that come with them. There are two locations that fall into this category, the nest and the wilderness. Let's first discuss the nest, which represents the need for connection in the form of friendship. The very word nest refers to a home or place of safety, often with siblings, as in the case of a bird nest. And there is certainly no shortage of playmates in the Clifftop Mansion. Only problem is, they're all dead. Children who end up here are quickly caught, skinned, and stuffed as dolls for the pretender to play with, and a great many rooms are dedicated to this taxidermy process. Speaking of which, there is of course another place in this world associated with taxidermy, the Hunter's Cabin and, by extension, the surrounding wilderness. This is no coincidence, as the region also represents the need for connection, but this time it is familial. The hunter is quite lucky to have a close family, one who cares about quality time and eye contact. Too bad they're all dead. When comparing the nest to the cabin, we can see some pretty obvious parallels. Both have stuffed humans set at dining tables for a meal they will never eat, while others are carefully placed for entertainment, whether that be watching TV or gazing out an attic window. Once love and belonging needs have been met, an individual can then move up to level 4, esteem needs. These include such things as self-esteem, achievement, respect, and status. There are two locations that fall into this category, both from the podcast. The Carnival from Chapter 4, which might also be the funfair scene in the Little Nightmares 3 trailer, and the Bathhouse from Chapter 2. The Carnival is honestly pretty easy to place, representing the need for achievement and validation. Unlike most places in Nowhere where children are pursued and killed, here at the carnival they are dressed up, their talents cultivated, and when placed under the spotlight they glow. At least, some of them. They are bright, talented, a spectacle to behold, and they hate every second of it. They are in fact prisoners, forced into this performance by the man in the purple suit and his creepy ventriloquist dummy. When Noon recalls her encounter with this being in her dream, she describes him as being full of hate, wanting the cheers and attention of the carnival audience for himself but never able to get it. 
The bathhouse is admittedly a bit more tricky to identify, but I would argue that it fits here as representing the need for absolution. How can you feel good about yourself when you are burdened by guilt, the weight of your sins pulling like a millstone around your neck? While children are generally not all too concerned with the concept of sin, per se, they can absolutely feel guilt. For example, it is regrettably common for children whose parents divorce to feel like it is their fault somehow. On their way to the bathhouse, residents of nowhere are able to purchase soaps and perfumes, which they then use to try scrubbing away their sins. Except there are no sponges to be found. The children caught in this dream are themselves used as sponges, as we see happen to Jester, but no matter how hard they try, these despicable residents will never actually become clean. At this point, we'll skip over level 5 and go straight to level 6, Aesthetic Needs. This category was added to the hierarchy model some time after the original was proposed and is concerned with the appreciation and pursuit of beauty and balance, creative expression through art, music, nature, and so forth. There are two locations that fall into this category, the hospital and the workshop from chapter 6 of the podcast. Starting with the hospital, which represents the need for artistic expression all thanks to the doctor. We are told that perfection is important to the doctor and he will not allow anything to interfere with his life's work. And what is this life's work? To transform the weak, pathetic humans of his world into creatures great and marvelous. As we see, the hospital isn't really a place of healing by any standard and is more akin to a freakish art studio, where the doctor experiments on his live subjects in all kinds of ways, removing limbs, removing heads, and replacing them with prosthetics of all shapes and sizes all in the pursuit of a perfection that will never be realized. And just as the hospital is piled with the doctor's materials from floor to ceiling, we know of another place filled with mountains of an artist's work. The workshop, as I've decided to call it, which might also represent the need for artistic expression. It appears in the final dream Noon experiences before crossing over the threshold, and in it she has a brief encounter with the entity she describes as the perfect lady a beautiful woman more mannequin than human, jittering as she sews costumes of all shapes, sizes, and colors. The walls are piled high with her patterned fabrics, and large racks are stuffed full with finished articles of clothing. Now, I do think there is something else going on here too, but that's a topic for another video. At this point, we find ourselves nearly at the top of the hierarchy model, but before getting into the final category, I want to first address a very significant outlier, a location that has no place in the model at all the Signal Tower. At first, this looks like a surprising omission considering its prominence and influence in the world of Little Nightmares and the fact that we already know exactly what it represents, escapism. The signature twist is also evident. The viewers of the surrounding city are indeed given a means of escaping the humdrum of their daily lives in the form of their televisions, but so powerful is the signal coming through them that they eventually escape from existence altogether by becoming one with the tower. The truth is, escapism, and more generally, entertainment and pleasure in all their forms, are not a part of Maslow's hierarchy despite being something that virtually all human beings pursue and experience in their lives. And while there are certainly arguments to be made for trying to fit escapism into an existing category or explain why it is unnecessary, I think there's a different connection to be made here. When your needs are not being met, when you aren't happy or satisfied with your life, what do you want to do? Escape. If each region in the world of Little Nightmares exists to fulfill a specific fundamental need, then I believe the Signal Tower is the great antithesis, the counterweight. It is what people seek when their needs are not met, when in their suffering they will do anything to escape from the pain, to numb it for a while. And screens do an excellent job of that. But unfortunately, this is no replacement for true fulfillment, and to lose yourself in this diversion will eventually lead to isolation and loneliness. It is perhaps no coincidence, then, that the shopping mall from Chapter 3 of the podcast is described as a place of overwhelming loneliness, for it shares much in common with the Signal Tower. Both are massive, fleshy creatures taking the shape of a human structure, and where the tower represents escapism, the mall might represent consumerism, another form of entertainment that can serve as a temporary stand-in for needs left unmet. As such, it makes sense that this location doesn't fit into Maslow's hierarchy either. I have plenty of other thoughts about the shopping mall with regard to this topic, but for the sake of time, they'll also have to wait for another video. Anyways, this brings us finally to the very top of the pyramid, self-actualization and transcendence. In essence, this final stage involves reaching your full potential, having peak experiences, becoming all you can be. 
And in the twisted world of nowhere, this stage isn't represented by a place, but rather by an achievement. Usurping the great adult oppressors of this world and obtaining the full measure of their status and power, just as Six and Mono do to the Lady and Thin Man, respectively. Curiously, Maslow himself believed that relatively few people would reach true self-actualization within their lifetimes, and this is consistent with the fact that most children in nowhere don't survive long enough to transcend in this way. Taking a step back now to view all the locations together, it is evident that some of these connections fit better than others, and you could absolutely make the argument for some of these locations fitting into other categories. For example, the schoolhouse fitting under cognitive needs since it's a place of learning. Too bad the students' heads are made of clay. Or the hospital fitting under esteem needs since the patients feel awful about themselves and wish for the doctor to fix them, to work his magic, and make them whole again not all too different from the guests of the bathhouse when you think about it. You also might be wondering why I divided Little Nightmares 2 by chapter, but counted the Maw as one. My reasoning here was that every location in the Maw is contained within the same vessel and ultimately contributes to the same central purpose of satisfying the hunger. While there is a potential case to be made for each chapter having a corresponding need, like the depths representing water, the hideaway representing warmth, and the ladies' quarters or residence representing self-esteem, some of them feel like a stretch, and I didn't want to get too far into the weeds here. In contrast, most of the areas within Little Nightmares 2 are quite independent of each other, being small parts of a big city. What's more, it makes sense for the wilderness, schoolhouse, and hospital to be their own dreams in particular because it would explain why they are still able to function in spite of the overwhelming pull of the signal tower. Since these locations fulfill a specific need, they are, in effect, insulated from the void of escapism that it represents. Regardless of how granular you want to make these categorizations, the key takeaway here is the possibility that these places do correlate to a need at some level, and while this is only a theory and may turn out not to be accurate, it does bring a great deal of context to the world of Little Nightmares. If we assume it to be true, or even to contain an element of truth, well, we now know what the nowhere is. This nightmarish realm is a reflection of the waking world a dark, ugly reflection of the suffering and trauma children experience at the hands of adults, a pain experienced through all of human history. And reflection really is the perfect word here because it evokes the image of a mirror, objects of great ubiquity and power in this world. For what do you see in a glass, darkly, when you are nothing but a reflection yourself? Okay, so I've covered a lot of things by this point, but there is still one big question left to answer. Why? What's the point of it all? What is the purpose of Nowhere? Fortunately for us, this is revealed in the final chapter of the podcast when Noon takes the ferryman's hand and crosses the threshold. She describes seeing countless eyes blinking and shimmering in the dark mist like a million tiny islands with a massive pulsing red eye in the center. I said at the beginning of the video that Nowhere was created by children, but that's actually not quite right. The realm was first inhabited by this eldritch entity, something akin to an elder god of the Lovecraftian mythos, though I would stress that this is a loose comparison and not by any means a definition. We really don't know what these creatures are. But we do know what they want. To feed, and it is strongly implied that the eyes feed on fear. In his theorizing about possible travel to this alternate dimension, the quiddity of consciousness, Otto's professor predicted that the keys required to enter the place were primarily cut out of fear. And it honestly makes sense. What better way to harvest fear than to trap the vulnerable children of humanity within their own nightmares? You could almost think of nowhere as a great cosmic skeleton, and the children's dreams within are as flesh, filling in the gaps between the bones to form a living hellscape darker than oblivion itself. So there you have it, my best explanation for nowhere, and if you enjoyed the theory, be sure to hit the like button and let me know what you think about it in the comments below. I had to cut a huge amount of material from this video to keep it focused and at a reasonable length, but suffice it to say I have plenty more thoughts to share about the places and creatures of nowhere while we wait for Little Nightmares 3. If that sounds at all interesting to you, be sure to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.